Hi everyone, welcome back to Project 2845. I've had a few days since introducing the project to think about and play with some uh, preamp configurations. And I think for the first stage, or input stage of the amplifier, I'm gonna implement this 6SN7 mu follower. Now it's called a mu follower because mu, which is the amplification factor parameter of a vacuum tube, is essentially met from input to output. So for example, 6SN7 has a amplification factor of 20. From V in to V out, if this is working perfectly with zero losses, we should get a gain of exactly 20. Now it doesn't work perfectly, um, and we won't get exactly 20, but uh, the better this tube, or the higher impedance this tube can present uh, onto the plate of this lower amplifying stage, the closer we get to that approximation. So for those who aren't familiar, the way this stage works is we've got a standard grounded cathode amplifier here where a signal comes in. And obviously if the signal on the uh, grid increases, we pull more current through the stack. However, if we assume for a second that this bottom tube isn't here, we have something that looks like on the top uh, a cathode follower. And that's basically what we have here. We've got a, a common uh, cathode amplifier with a cathode follower stacked on top. And so the if Vn increases and we conduct more current through this stack, the plate of the bottom tube is going to decrease. Uh, the voltage on the, on the plate of this bot bottom tube is going to increase. Therefore, the grid through this coupling capacitor is going to see that signal, and it's going to decrease its conduction. So Vn increase a positive signal on Vn increases this tube's conduction, and this top tube decreases its conduction. So they're actually working in tandem. Uh, it's kind of a what's often termed, although it's a slightly different configuration, a shunt regulated push pull amplifier. This is arranged in a special configuration called a mu follower. And essentially what this arrangement does is this top tube essentially acts as a constant current source for this bottom tube. So it's like, it's like a standard cathode, a common cathode amplifier, but we've got a really large resistor on the plate to the supply. And that's what this tube is doing. This RA value here uh, in this example 6.8 k ohms is essentially bootstrapped by the cathode follower action of this top uh, this top amplifier or this top tube and essentially makes that value appear much bigger this resistor here is essentially taking just a sampled portion of the voltage across here and referencing it back to the grid for biasing so this 620 ohms from uh, the cathode sampled back to the grid, if this is our reference node, it's essentially the same thing as having this 620 here. Here we've got ground, so both these nodes are at the same potential. Here we're tying them together with a 470 k ohm resistor. And that resistor needs to be there so we can effectively couple our signal up, develop that signal from the um, from this capacitor across this resistor and onto the grid. So this can't be a wire, it has to be a, uh, a moderately large resistor. So I've been playing around a few variations of the circuit and it works pretty well. Um, one thing to keep in mind is how the voltages stack across the tube and the cathode voltage of this upper tube will be elevated by the sum of all these voltages. And therefore, typically, this heater supply will have to be elevated so we don't violate the data sheet's um, minimum or maximum heater to cathode voltage. So in this case, 80 volts is a good starting point. And the reason, again, is because if I sum up the way these voltages stack up, the cathode of this top tube is sitting at 230 volts. If we take a look at a 6SN7 data sheet, If the heater was grounded, the maximum voltage the heat the, the cathode could be relative to our grounded uh, heater is only 200 volts. So we've already violated that spec here with our with our uh, 230 volts that this tube's sitting at. So if we elevate the heaters by 80 volts, then we 230 minus 80, we get some additional margin for signal swing before we violate that 200 volt spec. Input capacitance of the stage is maximized for a single tube because we're getting maximum gain. So if we assume a gain of 20, 
uh, with a 6s and 7, because of the Miller capacitance, we should get about 90 picofarads of input capacitance. So that's kind of a quick overview on how this stage works, and uh, it, it indeed does work very well. I've been prototyping this uh, amplifier stage in a prototype chassis that I'll show in a minute. And I've done a few different iterations. Uh, prototype 1 with that 6.8K equivalent RA resistor. Uh, prototype 2 in orange is the same stage, but I'm now uh, using DC filaments. So we can see a big reduction in noise. Here our THD is essentially noise limited until we start seeing harmonics show up, and then obviously up here we're clipping. So as this curve shifts down, we're just shifting essentially the noise floor down where our THD is noise limited. So versus output voltage, uh, the stage is doing really well. I mean, we're almost hitting 0.01%, completely open loop. And again, because this is a nice tube stage, this is, any distortion here is all second order, and we get really nice curve. This next design is an attempt to increase that RA value to further increase the impedance on our bottom tube to help linearize the tube and also provide a kinder load and a, and a slightly less steep load line for the cathode follower stage. Uh, that 10K we were just looking at was pretty aggressive. The other thing I was working on was better balancing the voltages. So assuming that this bottom tube, I've got 140 volts across it, that leaves us 260 remaining volts from a 400 volt supply. So what I'm looking at is splitting those up a little bit more evenly and having at our static DC bias point, 130 volts across the tube and 130 volts across the resistor string. With this tube sitting right in the, essentially the middle of its maximum possible voltage of 260 volts, we should get the maximum signal swing out of this tube. So the goal is that this will give us a little bit better performance than what we saw uh, on the screen here that gray curve with the 10K RA value. So that's what I'm gonna test in a minute. I just implemented this uh, resistor and these new bias resistor values in our uh, prototype chassis. So I'm gonna go show that in a minute. I'll show just real quick before we get there the comparison of the load line. So here's our 260 volts with our static bias point of 130 volts across the tube and our 18K load line. If we take into account the voltage drop uh, and our actual bias resistor values we can use, we're gonna get uh, about 6.8 milliamps uh, of DC current flow through the stage. So the cathode follower output isn't gonna be quite as robust as before. Um, here's the 10K. You can see the, see the difference in the steepness of the load lines between these two stages. So here we're at 8 milliamps. We're going to be down a little bit of current. Um, so we'll see how that affects things. We'll have maybe less ability to drive capacitance. But this is going to be driving the next preamp, uh, the next preamp stage, which shouldn't have too high capacitance. So I would think 6.8 milliamps should be enough. But we'll go test it now uh, with our audio precision and see how it performs. So here I've got our prototype chassis on our bench. I'm just using an old, uh, I believe it's from an organ or something similar, just an old chassis I purchased from somewhere. These are convenient to use because they've got tube sockets usually in them, and so they make prototyping stages like this pretty quick and easy, but I'm using the first slot there for our 6S and 7 mu follower stage. And this implementation has the 16K ohm RA resistor that I showed before. So we're going to be trying this and seeing how it performs. I'm using uh, just AC from the wall into this 8.2 volt filament transformer. And I'm using the linear regulator stage here from this prototype board. This high voltage section in the back is not being used. And this is doing my uh, AC to DC filament conversion with 8.2 volt AC filament transformer, I get enough uh, voltage across the linear regulator to get a nice uh, 6.3 volt DC out for the tubes. So that works really nicely. 
high voltage is supplied from my uh, high voltage Kepco power supply. So we're putting out approximately 500 volts and we're putting 500 volts out into this resistor here into that big uh, capacitor you see. And the reason I do that is to add additional RC filtering uh, and divide that 500 volts or, or drop that 500 volts down to 400 volts for our input tube stage here. So that filters the DC supply a little bit better. And the reason I guess I don't feed a capacitor directly is that, that power supply does not like capacitive loads um, and actually can oscillate. And when a uh, one kilovolt power supply oscillates, things can get pretty scary. So uh, definitely, if you're if you're doing this type of work and you've got high voltage power supplies and you want additional filtering, use an RC and uh, measure the current of your loaded stage to to get the proper R value and drop voltage into an RC like that to then feed your preamp rather than, you know, feeding a, a filter capacitor directly from a high voltage supply. So that's just something, that's my recommendation and some things I've uh, experienced during my testing. I also say I'm running these Tungsol 6SN7 tubes. These are new production tubes that do very well um, and I've had great results with them. So anyway, here's the stage. It's up and running. I've got my audio precision and uh, I've got my oscilloscope, my Tech um, 485 running behind there. On the audio precision, we can see the THD number 0.024% uh, with 100 millivolts input, which is approximately 1.957 volts out. So remember we said the gain of, a, of this mu follower with a 6S and 7 should be roughly 20. Here we're getting uh, 19.5 um, with 0.1 volts to 1.957 volts. So we're really close to that mu approximation. But let's run it uh, and see what its THD versus output does. So if you bear with me and go to our, over to our plotting screen and we'll plot THD versus output signal level by varying the input signal level to the stage. And look at that, our clipping point is just shy of about 50 volts. Now we don't need that much signal swing. We're gonna have an intermediate stage, at least one intermediate stage between the, this first mu follower stage and the grids of our 845 tubes. You know, we need 160, 170 volts peak signal swing on our 845 grid. So doing that all in one shot is not going to happen, but this stage gives us really nice results. And if we use maybe a low gain, um, maybe a lower gain triode, like a 45 tube or um, a 6BX7 or something like that, we might get a gain of 5 to 10. So it gives us, a, this, this headroom on the stage gives us quite a bit of range um, for our driver stage selection, our next stage selection, in terms of what gain it needs in order to get peak signal into the grids of the 845s. My guess is we're going to be running this maybe to 10 to 12 volts peak, uh, the RMS, sorry. But eight, this is an RMS voltage measurement, but eight to 10, 12 volts RMS would probably be the peak output we'd wanna get from this stage. And that puts us right about the 1% mark. So that's how, this, that's how this stage performs. I'm gonna compare it and pull the data uh, and compare it against the other prototypes on that Excel sheet I showed earlier. And we'll wrap it up by comparing this to the other designs and see uh, which one we like the most. So I'm back from the bench and entered the measured values we took off the audio precision for this latest prototype with our uh, 18k ohm RA resistor. Again, the goal here was to linearize the available signal swing better on our top cathode follower. And what that would also do is with this higher resistor values, get, again, present a higher impedance load to our bottom tube. With this latest prototype, we see a little bit of a reduction in headroom which um, may be that the signal swing is not as 
as great as we thought it would be uh, on our load line, which is fair. Um, the noise performance and you know null, our, our lowest THD measurement point is about the same as our uh, 10K example. So just looking at this curve, it's not too big of a difference. If we look at the THD versus frequency of these different designs, at 10 volts, not too much of a difference. Our latest version uh, has a little bit higher THD at higher frequencies, but that worsens as the signal amplitude increases. So this is 10 volts RMS. If we go to 20 volts RMS, uh, the signal swing really starts uh, giving up um, some THD performance at higher frequency. The reason for this is really the current flowing through the stack. So the 10K uh, RA example, we had eight milliamps flowing through the stack with this 18K and again, juggling these voltages to try to get more swing out of this top tube. The current went down to 6.7 milliamps. With this lower current uh, through the stack, we have less current swing available into our load. Now I took a look at, uh, back through the specification of the audio precision and the input to the, to the input stage of the audio precision is a 220 picofarad load. I then went and measured the cable I was connecting the audio precision with to the, the circuit across this 47K for, uh, resistor and that was an additional 100 picofarads. So we essentially had 320 picofarads of loading across this 47K ohm resistor. At 100 to 200 kilohertz, that's a pretty significant load, and we're loading this output stage pretty heavily. So we're getting a voltage division effect from whatever impedance uh, from the output of this cathode follower, which is quite low, so that's not too much of an issue. But more importantly, at these higher signal swings and higher frequencies, we're not able to slew enough current into that capacitor or that equivalent capacitance. So we're getting some slew rate limiting distortion. It's likely not gonna be this bad in circuit. Whatever driver tube we put in here um, or connect to the output of the stage is likely not gonna present a 320 picofarad load. However, knowing what we know, I think uh, this prototype four with the uh, 10K ohm load, the gray curve, is probably our best bet. It's got same essentially THD performance, a little bit more headroom, and because of the higher current for our available 400 volt supply for this total stack, um, gives us a little bit better high frequency performance. The last thing I'll show is the bandwidth between all of these. So this is the bandwidth unnormalized. Um, so this is the, the, sorry, this isn't THD, this is actually the gain in dB, so ignore that. But the gain of all of these stages increases as that RA resistor value increases, which makes sense because we're presenting, again, that lower tube with a higher impedance. So our latest prototype with our 18K RA gave us the highest gain. The 10K RA case was the, was the second highest gain. If we look at the gain normalized, so we take the one kilohertz number and normalize all those curves to zero dB, we get essentially the same curve for all of these prototypes. And we're minus three dB down right at 10 hertz and minus three dB at 150 kilohertz or so. So pretty wide bandwidth, really great THD. And for the signal swings that we need, again, with a driver tube in between this and the grids of our 845s, we've got plenty of signal swing and gain here. You know, we're not gonna get in remotely up in this region of the THD curve. Um, so we should be staying well below or around the 0.1% max uh, from this stage under most scenarios. So hope this was useful and interesting for a lot of you um, and we'll talk with you soon. Take care.